Hello, I'm Hog, this is The Dice, this ridiculous lump here is Casper, and today we're going to be talking about the Puka. The subject of this Irish folklore video was chosen by my patrons on Patreon. You can help vote to decide what kind of content I make by signing up for as little as $1 a month. Now, in case you're not familiar with puka, puka is uh, an Irish term for snail. Or maybe it's a kind of mushroom? It could be a children's game. Or a kind of fairy. Or a kind of ghost. Or a shape-shifting horse. Or the fairy that rides around on the back of the horse. Or, or a ghost that rides around on the back of the horse. Or it could be a grumpy owl fella. L let's go into it. Let's talk about it. So on changlin.ie, which in my opinion is one of the best English-Irish dictionaries out there, one of the definitions they give for the term puka is a surly, uncommunicative person. Uh, there are several entries on dukas.ie when you look up the term puka that do use it to refer to an individual, usually a man, usually uh, elderly, who um, lives a kind of hermited lifestyle, who lives up out on the edges of society and doesn't talk to people very often. Um, so yeah, puka can mean a cantankerous owl fella, which is very, very interesting. And we're gonna be coming back to that definition later, so put a pin in it for now. Uh, there are several entries on Dukas.ie, if you look up the term Puka, that show that Puka was also the name for a children's game, similar to Blind Man's Buff. You would have several children, one of them would wear a coat or some other piece of fabric over their head, obscuring their vision. Uh, this piece of fabric would be called a Pukin, and then the Puka would chase around the other children, blindfolded, and the first one they caught would be the next Puka. Just an interesting thing, just uh, seemed to be a common game throughout all of Ireland, played by children, where they would pretend to be a puka. Uh, the term puka pel refers to a kind of mushroom, specifically, usually specifically, the horse mushroom. Uh, horse mushrooms are very much associated with fairies for two reasons. Number one is that horse mushrooms usually grow in rings, so fairy rings. And secondly, because Puka Pel is usually the name given to the kind of mushroom that the leprechaun is found sitting on or sitting under. Puka Puka, put out your horns, and I will give you bread and butter in the morn. Now, this rhyme was part of a folk remedy for warts, and the puka being referred to in this case is a snail, uh, the horns being the snail's eye stalks. Uh, and the horns are actually important because, as you'll see later, the more supernatural creature the puka is often associated with having horns. Now, how this cure would work is that you would rub the snail on the wart while saying a version of that rhyme, and then you would put the snail in a bag and hang the bag from a tree, or impale the snail on a thorn on the tree and you would leave it there, and once the snail had rotted away, your wart would fade away as well. I will be talking about the puka's horns and the rest of the association of snails with pukas later, so let's just a pit, put a pin in that for a moment, or, or maybe put a thorn in. Okay, so there are frequent heated debates in certain circles about whether puka should be thought of as ghosts or as fairies, and this is either going to stop those debates altogether or make them much, much worse, because the answer... They're both. It's both. They're both. They're both at the same time. Um, there's not even that much difference between the two, really. Not in Irish folklore, anyway. 
So first, we'll talk a little bit about how we came to a point where people feel like there needs to be a very strong division between ghosts and fairies, and as usual, we can blame the Victorians. I feel like a large amount of my career revolves around correcting the damage done by the Victorian era. So in the 18th century, Carl Linnaeus writes a book called Systema Naturae, and in this book he suggests a new classification system for animals and uh, plants and basically everything. And that whole idea we have of like uh, the kind of classification tree with kingdom, class, order, genus, species, that was Carl Linnaeus, he came up with that. And this became incredibly popular pretty much immediately. Now, uh, the thing is, the Victorian folklorists at the time, they were jealous of their friends in the social clubs who were amateur biologists or amateur zoologists who were getting to use this system. And so, because they wanted to use it too, the Victorian folklorists started imposing very, very heavy kind of strict definitions and strict classifications onto folkloric creatures. Now, a lot of the names they were using for these classification systems were names that were common in folk tradition at the time. Not all of them, but the vast majority of them. However, the rigid classifications, the rigid definitions, were not something that existed before these folklorists came along. In fact, often these folklorists would invent characteristics to help um, further delineate and further define and, and create rigid boundaries between different kinds of creatures. And if you think this all sounds very petty and childish, you are absolutely correct. Folklore in its natural state is very fluid, it's very changeable, so when it seems very rigid and definite, that's usually a sign of direct outside interference, usually colonial in nature. So when we see the idea in the works of Croker or Yeats of Puka being very rigidly defined as fairies and fairies being very rigidly defined as different to ghosts, that is more the result of people attempting to keep up with fashions amongst uh, antiquarians of the period and less, less to do with a real reflection of widespread folk belief at the time. Uh, because fairies and ghosts are treated very similarly within Irish folklore, I feel it's best to talk about the puka characteristics from both sides together all at once. So let's do that. November's night is called Puka Night, as there are pukas everywhere on that night. The old people used to say that there are pukas on every rafter of the house on that night, watching for the people to pray for them. The thing about this quote is that it could just as easily be interpreted in either direction. November night is another term for Halloween, and on that night, both fairies are supposed to be abroad, and the dead are supposed to emerge to visit their families. Another entry talking about Halloween says, The woman of the house bakes parleys, or rectangular cakes made with flour and potatoes, and she puts these out on the windows for the pukas, as there is a saying that the dead people's souls, which were in purgatory on their way to heaven, on account of all the prayers the people say during the day, for the repose of their souls. Uh, that one is a little more definite in the favour of the dead. The story of the Puka of Killeen also has a Puka that only begins to appear after a man has been murdered and appears on the spot where he was murdered, implying that the Puka was the murdered man. There's also an entry talking about a field in Limerick called Puka Dween, which is named after the Puka because it was supposedly haunted by a ghost. Places where a person has died or where a ghost is commonly encountered often have the word puka in their name as a result. On the other hand, many places whose names feature the word puka are tied to fairies in general. For example, a cave called Karakapuka was said to be where the fairies, we are told, played and danced and had their sports in the olden days and even to the present day. This association with place names that include the word puka, getting their names from a connection to fairies, is roughly as common as places that get the names from ghosts. There's also numerous entries that list the word puka among both names for fairies in general and for specific kinds of fairies, and a couple even list puka as another word for leprechaun. And there's even more entries on Dukas that don't attempt to define the puka at all. 
All they do is describe what kind of creature it is, what it looks like, what its behavior is like, but they don't try to categorize it or say, oh, it's definitely a fairy or it's definitely a ghost or anything like that. And according to Owen de Vardun in his book, Why the Moon Travels, which is a collection of Minkeri folk tales, um, there seems to be a belief in Minkeri folklore that the puka is in fact uh, one of the horses that used to pull the dead coach but managed to escape. And that could be read very easily as either a fairy or as a ghost or as both, honestly. Anyway, I think I've managed to establish that reading the puka as a ghost or as a fairy is equally legitimate, that both make perfect sense. In fact, you could even read it as a combination of the two. Because it doesn't matter, really. The characteristics and behaviour of the puka are the same no matter what kind of entity you read it as. Uh, the puka is jet black in colour. It is most commonly seen in the form of animals, especially horses, goats and rabbits, though other animals have been reported. Uh, the puka is occasionally seen as a specific humanoid fairy riding on horseback, which is very, very interesting. Uh, the puka is very much associated with Halloween. Uh, the puka is supposed to be abroad on Halloween night, wherein it spits on, pisses on, or otherwise befouls blackberries and other fruits. And you're not supposed to eat blackberries especially, but sometimes other fruits after that night, because the puka is supposed to have placed its evil upon them and will come for anyone who takes them after, or just because the puka has befouled them, you will get sick. Uh, the on Halloween night, people would often leave out food for the puka, usually potato-faced, but sometimes other forms. After the advent of people like Croker and Yates, other characteristics have been added to the puka, especially the idea of it having blazing red or yellow eyes. Uh, hold on a moment, hold on a moment. So, a puka, by our modern interpretations, is... A shape-shifting creature that is jet black, has blazing red and yellow eyes, can talk like a human, and is something of a trickster. Kit and Car from Knight Rider fit the description, the modern description of a puka. Knight Rider, it's all about puka. Isn't that right, Casper? Knight Rider's all about puka, isn't it? David Hasselhoff was riding around inside a puka. A uh, one thing the puka is very strongly associated with is tricking or physically forcing travelers out on their own at night up onto the puka's back and then it will carry them off on mad crazy adventures all over the countryside, usually quite frightening and harrowing in nature that leave the uh, the traveler in a very distressed state afterwards. But the reports of these stories aren't always malicious. There are some stories where people will intentionally and willingly join the puka on one of these adventures and actually profit from it or at least have a good time. And again in Owen Daverdoon's book Why the Moon Travels we have stories where the puka will help members of the Minkeri culture who are lost or who are in danger and will help them find a safe place or help them find their way home. So the puka is not always a malevolent creature in every aspect of the folklore of our What's really interesting about all of this, all of these conflicting definitions of puka is that there is an entry on Dukas talking about the story of Puka Pronia. In this story, the Puka starts off as an old hermit living on his own. He then dies, his corpse turns into a snail, the snail then goes to live on a fairy hill, and then any time anyone who is sick, elderly or injured is passing by that hill and wants help getting home, they go up to the snail and they ask for help. The snail then transforms into a huge black horse with the head of a snail 
and carries them home, very much like the benevolent version of the Puka adventure stories. But at one point, a man who is neither sick, injured, nor elderly comes and asks the snail for help. The snail turns into the horse again, and this time carries the young man off on one of the more harrowing, one of the more malevolent Puka adventures. Uh, this is really, really interesting because it involves so many of the different um, interpretations, the different definitions of the word Puka in one singular story. Now, it's tempting to think of this as one singular ancient primordial story, which is where all of the different definitions for the word puka originally stemmed from. However, it's important to remember that we are not dealing with a written manuscript here. We're not dealing with like some centuries old manuscript that was found in a bog somewhere that predates everything else we know. We are dealing with a piece of the oral tradition. And for a piece of oral tradition to be that ancient and to have been that widespread to have influenced the world or well the the culture of Ireland so much we'd expect to see a lot more of it we'd expect to see lots of different versions of from all over the country however I've only found one story I think I found it in two different entries but only one singular version of the story and that doesn't track with the idea that this is the origin of all of the different definitions and all of the different versions of the Puka. What seems more likely to me is that this story was composed after the fact. In my opinion, this story wasn't just composed to bring all the definitions or as many as possible of the definitions of the word Puka together in a singular story. I think this story was composed specifically to be a joke about how many definitions there are. What you have to remember is that this entry was recorded in English, it was written down in English. And the entry itself only uses the word Puka in relation to the given name Puka Pronia, the, the name of the central character. It just gives the other stages in transformation by their English terms. But if we were to think about it in Irish, it would be Puka died and turned into a puka and then the puka went to live on a fairy hill and any time anyone wanted help pook the puka would turn into a puka and carry them home but one time someone tried to get help who didn't need it and then the puka turned into a puka and so on and so forth it's puka transforming into a puka transforming into a puka and you would only really understand what puka is which from context that to me suggests that it was deliberately composed as a joke because that is objectively hilarious. The puka turned into a puka turned into a puka turned into a puka is absurdist comedy and I think that's wonderful. Now I have no real substantial theory over how we came to have so many definitions of the word puka within uh, the Irish language. However, if I were to hazard a guess I would say it's largely due to outside influence. In fact, I would say the supernatural creature, the Puka, is the most likely candidate for being the product of outside influence. Um, Old Norse languages, Old English languages, and the languages of other Celtic nations all have similar words to Puka that describe similar supernatural creatures, but don't have the same widespread um, excess of definitions. So I would say the supernatural creature of the Puka was probably brought to Ireland through our interaction with those other cultural groups and that terms like the Puka as a snail or the Puka as a hermit were the original Irish um, definitions of the word and the word then came to share those definitions, those other supernatural definitions, later through our interaction with other cultures. But again, that's only if I were to hazard a guess. I don't know, and I don't think we're likely to find out. <laughs> Thank you.
Uh, thanks for watching this video revisiting the Puka. Uh, you may have noticed I've been a little slow on production lately, that's because I've been sick numerous times, and um, that slowness is going to continue as um, I've been booked in for eye surgery. Not on my bad eye, I've been told that's a lost cause. This is for surgery on my good eye, which has actually started to go bad. So I'm getting surgery to kind of halt it where it is, so I don't lose further vision. I can I can see pretty well at the moment, like it's not full 2020, or would that just be 20? I don't know how that works, but anyway. Um, so yeah, uh, things will be slow for a little while. I also have to take more time to work on the, uh, the big December video, which I have, uh, been lining up some good collaborators for, so I'm looking forward to that. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this video. Um, I'd like to thank all of my patrons, including the ones whose names will be scrolling by here once I actually record their names, because I forgot I'd have to do that. So yes, thank you to all of my patrons, especially the great Ashkarp, first of her name, Keeper of the Magikarp and Empress of the Great Shiny Sea, Sarah Connolly, Queen of Goblins, Protectress of the Labyrinth, and a Lucite Cross, uh, all of the patrons whose names you see scrolling across the screen here, and just all of my patrons in general, and everyone who has liked or commented on any of my videos. Those are actually very, very helpful. Thank you. And, um, yeah, if you want to contribute to the channel, I've got a Patreon, I've got Ko-fi, links are in the description, along with the script and bibliography for this video. And, uh, just remember that your applause is the only way to counteract my daily chant of I don't believe in fairies. <laughs>